<laughs> I'm Mary Salas, I'm a CPA um, and have my own financial planning firm with a partner. And so my partner is a CPA who does tax planning and tax preparation. I'm a CPA who does financial planning for individuals and especially women, and especially women who have businesses because a business is a big part of your financial plan, both eating up cash flow at the beginning of its life and hopefully spitting out a lot of cash flow during and at the end. And so the life cycle of a business or maybe many businesses throughout your life, um, you, you hope that the eating up of the cash flow in the early years gets less and less and the spitting out of additional cash flow gets all the better and can then perhaps even feed the next business and the business after that, or they don't have to be linear. They can be, you know, this one feeds this one. Now you have two, this two feeds two more. And um, so the younger you start with a great idea and that's my message. Just five really big mistakes that a lot of people make. I've made some of them. I'm not going to admit to them all, but um, you may have done that too. And if you're just starting out or we're sort of in the middle and still committing some of these five deadly sins, um, you might consider um, rethinking some of those, some of those. So the first one, in my opinion, we talked about discipline is not being disciplined. And if you're going to run a business, you need to keep track of your expenses and your income. So many people who don't like to do that kind of thing, either in a business sense or on a personal sense, and there's a lot of us out there, um, need to hire somebody to, to find someone to do that. Now, it might be a friend, although sometimes you don't want your friends to know your personal stuff, but maybe the business isn't, you know, is not quite so personal to you. Um, but find someone who likes to do that. They're detail oriented. They, um, they don't like to make mistakes. They're the perfectionists that you love. Not all perfectionists can you love, but these are the ones that you love because they're going to keep you going strong. And that means, number one, having some kind of software that you use, um, whether it's QuickBooks or Quicken, or there's lots of them out there, finding the one that best fits your needs to keep track of what income is coming in, and especially at the beginning, the expenses. Because from a tax perspective, you can write off the first $5,000 of expenses. That's just an immediate write-off in the first year of your business. Um, after that, you have, to, you have to put them all together and amortize, it's called. So it's taking a, a little piece of it each year over um, 15 years. So you've got up to $15,000, um, excuse me, $5,000 to buy a computer, to get software, to find a place, to rehab the space at home, to buy a chair, a desk, furnishings, anything that's ordinary and necessary. Those are the two phrases that the IRS deems necessary in order to deduct this from your income. And only the first year? No, every year thereafter, but only the first year are startup because usually there's startup expenses that are more like one-time expenses. Um, so it's more like if you pay an attorney to to put together partnership agreements or other documents. So there's a certain amount of that that you can write off every year, but they're, if they're particular to starting the organization, they'll only allow you to take 5,000 of that in the first year without having any income even, okay? And, and this is an open forum, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, Anna Marie, can you watch for questions from Yes. Zoom? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. Yes. Okay. The second really big thing is to have a separate bank account. Do not, do not mingle your personal funds with your business funds. It's a mess and it doesn't show that you're really in business. And if you're not really in business, you can't deduct business expenses. Especially this year, um, the new tax act said 
there's no if if there's no hobby loss. So if it, if you're just pretending to be in business or you think you can make some money at this, you know, you really need a team to talk about are you really in business or not. Okay? I have a question yes. regarding this. It's sometimes when you are a solopreneur, all your expenses come from the business you deliver. So you can have your business account to receive the money from your clients. And then you can take this money and put it on your personal account to pay your things that you are paying yourself? Yes. Yes. You can do that. Absolutely. You have to keep track of that. It's like it's called advance to owner, or it can be considered a salary, depending on the type of business entity you have. And having the right business entity is important to speak with the CPA tax planner kind of person. So I'm not slamming tax prep places like H&R Block, but that's what they do. They prep it after the fact. They're not planning. They're not telling you, you should really take this step to avoid this or take this step to really enhance this. They're not planners. So you want to find a CPA or what's called an EA, an enrolled agent, who is has passed some exams with the IRS to prove they have some knowledge of tax law. Okay. Or one step better, a debit account is a debit card is good, but in these days of security, right, right, right. a credit card would be better. Yeah. And then you just pay once a month to the credit card company yeah. from your business checking account. And the credit card company will send you a, uh, a statement at the end of the year of all, a summary of all your expenses. So it's, yeah. they do a lot of bookkeeping for you, but they might not know that King Supers also sells gas and not just groceries. So those kinds of things, you know, you have to follow up on all of those. Okay. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, now, keeping track of your expenses, these, you know, uh, receipts you get that fade after a few months. <laughs> the be a best practice is take a picture of it and then store it electronically, get a shtick, whatever you call those things. <laughs> Keep, don't, don't keep the paper receipts. They, they're going to be gone after a while. Give them monthly to the person who's keeping your books, but keep a digital copy, and then you can destroy them later. You've got a digital copy. Well, not if you're audited. Auditors want to see backup. Just because it's a, just because it's posted on your QuickBooks doesn't mean well, you really. Think of, you guys buy things. Yeah. Me too. Me too. You're you're better off. I mean, these days the IRS is so low on staff that um, there are very few audits happening these days. But if you were hap if you were audited, okay, you could have a monthly statement that shows you bought uh, five thousand dollars at Best Buy, but they don't know whether that was a TV or in a, in a chair or whether it was something for your business. So your best practice is to have some kind of a receipt, take a picture of it so you've got documentation of exactly what it was you bought and that it was an ordinary and necessary expense of business. I know you always wonder, when is the IRS really gonna come right. after you? And like, want to know what, what I bought at Best Buy. Right. Okay. Now, keeping track of mileage. Um, it used to be you need to, you had to keep a log of beginning mileage, ending mileage, subtracted. Here's the number of miles. Where did you go? Why was it a business? expense. Um, these days, if you just say I went 50 miles to the airport and back because I was at a conference in Dallas last week. 
So having a little notebook or there's lots of apps. I'm still in the old notebook age, but there's apps to keep track of your mileage too. Um, but business mileage in 2021 is 56 cents a mile. So keeping track of it is usually worth it to deduct it. And so that it, I'm sure you're aware does not include commuting. So if your office is here at RISE and you drive here every day, you cannot deduct that mileage. But if you go to an appointment at a client's from RISE to that appointment and back is deductible mileage. If you go from home one day and don't come to RISE, you go from home to your client and back and that's 50 miles and you have to subtract from that technically what your mileage would have been from your house to RISE, for instance. Okay, so commuting expenses don't count as a deductible expense. Okay, parking for business, um, office expenses, supplies, blah, blah, blah. You all know that. Now, cell phones. Cell phones, um, you can deduct a percentage of the cell phone bill based on usage. So let's say your cell phone costs you $200 a month and you use it basically half the time. Now, try to document that, you know, you, it's a gray area. Yeah. But if you say it's probably safe to say that you're using your cell phone half of the time, and so you could deduct half of your cell phone bill. Um, what if your cell phone is your primary business phone? Can you deduct all of it? If you use it 100%. But like, I, I need a phone 100%, but then I use it for other things. So that's, that's a gray a area. area. That's a gray area. <laughs> okay. I'm, on, I'm being taped, so <laughs> I'll tell you something differently offline. <laughs> what, about, what about the social media apps like your phone? So for My example, addiction is important. For example, <laughs> millennials spend 211 minutes a day on social media. For a lot of us, that's where we spend our time to put, where we're interacting with clients, trying to do content, whatever it is. Is that if, considered social media? If you can justify it for business, that that, you know, if you say 75% of your total usage is business related, I'm looking for business clients, I'm speaking with prospects, I'm, yes. You have to document it, that's the important thing. You don't make it up when you find out you're an IRS audit coming. So it's just a good habit to have. So documenting it, yeah, that's my next question. Yeah. Did you write down I use X amount of minutes or do just in general? Per day, per day, per month? I, know that I would never do it per day. No. Okay. Because I know that there is apps that you can use on your phone. It's like this week, you can use the 15 minutes. And on God's account, but yeah. it's kind of scary to look at. But <laughs> did you document that in a spreadsheet saying, okay, the week of this, the week of blah, blah, I was on this many minutes on my phone and this percent was work? Uh, it would be wonderful if you were a perfectionist, <laughs> but we run a business. Right. Okay. So, so just use good judgment, okay. ordinary and necessary. Would somebody else in your position be using that much time for business? You know, it, if it comes down to a dollar here and there, there's, there's, it's not worth keeping track of. Yeah, no. big picture. This is big picture stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, home office expense. So how many of you have an office at home and an office somewhere else? Home office expense typically has been, you can write off the percentage of the house that your office is in if it is exclusively used for business. Um, and you don't have another place of business, primary. It's your primary purpose. It's your primary place of business is what I mean. Um, now, if you have a, if you have an office here and you have an office at home, but this is your primary business, if you're doing administrative and management things in your home office at home, which most of us would be doing right. It's a, again, it's a gray area, but you could write off a portion of home office expense. Now what's in home office expense. Let's say the room is 200 square feet, you are going to have to get a general dimension of it. 
and 200 square feet of your 2,400 square foot house is uh, whatever that percentage is. I can't do it right on my feet here. That percentage of your interest expense on a mortgage, your utilities, um, any other expenses related to the house that an office would need, for instance, in, is included. Now, if you have a you have a bathroom somewhere close by, you have to have a bathroom to have an office. So you could extend, you know, that 200 to 220 square feet or whatever. Um, So, or rather than have actual expenses, you can just say $5 a square foot up to $1,500 a year. So basically you've got some room up to $1,500 a year that you could take an additional tax. I mean, the IRS will look at it, but if you are, work, if you work every other day at home, that's, you know, clearly management and administrative. Question. Yes. If you're Past your first year, just slightly, and now think I need to go out an office at home. Dedicated space. Mm -hmm. I have an office that's just been open here for six months. I literally can clean the place on my head. Uh -huh. But there's a space I can build it out, and it's past that first year. You could still keep track of that now. The the question would be, that's a really good question for a person who does this full time tax. <laughs> so, you know, if, or if you finished uh, an office in the garage or you finished an office in a, uh, you added a room, like you said, yeah, you, you can do that. Now, can you, add, you can't take the cost of construction. You can take the cost of expensing it, but, but there might be, yeah. Yeah. Right. Per year. That's a really good question. Now, if you own a, ho a motel and there's an empty room, that is the one exception. They won't let you take a room in a motel as your office. If you own the motel, go figure. If you don't own it, you can't. So there's always, there's always those exceptions. Um, business trips. So you go to a conference, you go, you're a photographer and you go take photography classes. Um, those kinds of things are deductible in full, including the airfare, uh, parking, Uber, whatever, okay? As well as meals on the road. Now that brings up entertainment and, and business meals. So you are entertaining your clients. You go out to dinner. It used to be you, you could only deduct half of that. Since the pandemic for 20, 21, and 22, you can deduct 100% of that. Okay, so use your local restaurants, help the business, and write it off. Um, all right, you hire somebody, contract work, of course, that's deductible. You hire somebody as an employee, that's deductible. Um, Inventory, I don't know if any of you have businesses that include inventory. That's a whole nother gig. We'll talk about that offline. That's a really important thing to keep track of. Cost of goods, you know, think purchases coming in, sales, all that kind of bookkeeping stuff. Like if you're running a uh, Mary Kay or something like that, you know people that have an inventory at home. That's another level of bookkeeping. Okay, anything about ordinary and necessary expenses and keep track of it, being a, disciplined. A question from St. Louis. I'm gonna have a sure. Okay, this question is from Laura. Um, when does the first year start technically? Is it when you register your business, when you make your first expense, when you get your first revenue? What, what starts the first year? That's a very good question to which I am not 100% certain of the answer. Okay. I can tell you what I think it is, but I'm not going to okay. because I, I don't do it that way. Um, I will get back to you. I'll okay. get back to her. Okay. All right. I can tell you that they will close your bank account if you open it even a month prior to when you sign up your LLC. I have that happen. So it could be the filing date of your LLC or your but sometimes you file, you, you get the name, and then you don't really do anything with it for six months. So I'm not sure that that 
is always the case. Yeah, but then you could also never have the <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my LLC, I, I, I started like almost three years ago, and I, 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 I might say that my first revenue was two years later than was just opening the LLC. Mm -hmm. So distinguishing a business from a hobby is something that, that brings up that um, important question. Um, a business is set is started with the anticipation that you will make money, make a profit. A hobby is something fun to do that, oh, by the way, I've brought in some money. Um, and so technically, you, you need to be making three out of five years show a profit. Okay, in order to deduct those expenses. But in the first couple of years, you don't know that. So you file and then you file the next year. And then, you know, it's a good idea to start showing some profit. So, um, because hobby. What type of profit? Like $5? Sure. Okay. You just have to show a profit. Okay. I think the IRS is kind of rude about that. I mean, most small businesses fail, right? So they expect you to be profitable in three years? No. Within five years, okay. you have a five-year window, and you should have profit three of those five years. Now, is there some gray area in that? Oh, this is big time. For yeah. You. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I made the comment last time. I know for a fact they'll let you go seven years without a profit. Yeah. Six years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's just then keeping your stuff in relation to your right. Right. Yes, there there are ways. I'm very good at keeping my expenses high. <laughs> and revenue. And revenues. So the, the first big mistake is not being disciplined about keeping track of your expenses and your revenue. And so that also involves, you know, sending out invoices, having a really structured set uh, structured method for billing people, getting paid following up on collections, that kind of thing. Okay. The second thing is, in my opinion, not engaging financial professionals. So um, a tax preparer, a tax planner, a financial planner, a computer specialist so that you don't get hacked or and that you've got uh, procedures in place to keep your passwords strong, to change them regularly, to make sure you have a good, uh, safe system, um, and that you have either a formal or informal board of directors, somebody to bounce ideas off of. Um, I wish I'd done that far earlier than I did, um, just to say, does this make sense? Am I thinking straight? Have I forgotten anything? Um, so being part of a team that looks at the, the various aspects of your business. Okay, the third thing we've already talked about is making not making it a hobby, or if you're if you're creating a business from from a hobby, just to do it with some intention. You know you're planning on making a profit and and executing likewise, because if you then don't make a profit and you have to go back and and amend your returns and can't take the losses that you've incurred, it gets to be mess a mess. Okay, the fourth thing is not funding a retirement plan when you do show profits. So there's some very easy plans, simple, one's called a simple IRA. There's Roth IRAs, there's SEP IRAs, there's a plethora of ways to set aside money for retirement pre-tax or post-tax. So if you're not in a very high tax bracket, doing a Roth contribution is a very smart idea um, as long as if if you have a spouse and they're in an employer plan that you're maximizing the employer match if there is one that you're i mean there's a lot of tax planning around, around retirement plans and you can only contribute to a retirement plan if you have earned income so you have to show some income in order to set money aside tax-free in retirement account there's a couple of exceptions to that rule, like there always are. Um, and that being if you, if your spouse 
is earning and you are not, you may put in up to $6,000 a year in an IRA. And if you're 50 or over, you put in 7,000. It's not a lot, but there is that. So there's a lot of retirement plans and you should think about them from the start when you do your planning. So it, one of the sheets you have is three buckets of money and that's um, setting aside money in the first bucket for short-term goals, one to three years, four to seven years, mid intermediate and over five, uh, seven years for long-term goals. The same sheet could be used for your business planning. You know, what, what do I want to, where do I want to be three years from now? If I say uh, three years from now and I'm looking back to today, where do I want to be and how do I want to get there? And that's where this team of, you know, your informal or formal board of directors can help you. Um, I use this three bucks of money with all of my financial planning clients. So they drop their, we put the assets into each bucket and then we put their cash flow and just cash outflow anticipated in those buckets and then see we invest according to the timeline on when that outflow is going to happen. So invest, not investing is also important. And that's why the retirement planning while you're earning money is so important. Would you say that like at what point are people, what point in that three to five years very hard to do and it's only in a I would say a fairly rare situation where somebody finds a huge client early on that allows you to fund but it should always be in the back of your mind it's the same as setting aside monies for your kids education it should always be in the back of your mind it might not be front and center but it should be in the back of your mind I just to that feeling teenager, you know, I wish I'd started a Roth with my babysitting money because then the five-year clock starts running. There's so many exceptions to so many rules on a Roth, but the, if once you start, those exceptions fall away after five years, many of them do, and you have access to the money that you at least input without penalty. So um, just get one started. Start it for your teenagers. Start it for, you, anybody can fund it as long as there's earned income. 
Right. There is it's based on your modified adjusted yeah, gross. So I do plan to do that eventually in the next year or so if she can pay to take it out. And she was talking about some other benefits. So I was worried because I started it 18 years ago. Will I be penalized? You can always take out what you've put in. You can't take out the earnings without penalty. But what you yeah. So there is um the five year right. Yeah. And the same thing, uh, converting to a Roth IRA, which this may be the last year you can do this. So everyone here, ask your tax preparer if you're if if this is the right time to do a Roth conversion. So what that does is takes your IRA or a 401k if you're no longer there. Yeah. You roll it from the 401k into an IRA and then and pay the tax now but it's forever so far until they change the tax law <laughs> um, tax free so a roth conversion should be on everybody's list and you have to do it before the end of the year you can't do it on april 14th you can fund other iras through april 15th a roth conversion has to happen during the year and you can't go back and undo it so you need some tax expertise on that i'm sure we have members who are experts like that or i can give you some names so i had someone my previous financial person we were doing that every year she figured out what the threshold was of the ability to actually tax it right like two thousand dollars and so they could take that to the rock And it's amazing how it builds up, even three thousand dollars at a time. Mm -hmm. Because in uh, later in life, that impacts. There's no tax impacts at all. You can take it whenever you need it. There's no required minimum distributions. It's a beautiful vehicle, and to take that away from the American public, in my opinion, is <laughs> hopefully done with the tax rate will be twenty years. Right. Now, if you know, if your if your joint income is four hundred thousand or more. It's probably not, doesn't make sense, but it might even at that bracket, because if it's no longer available, it's still better to take pay tax and let it grow tax deferred for 20, 30, 40 years. Tax free, I see it, not tax deferred. Sorry, I misspoke. Tax free. Yeah. <laughs> and so the last of the five is planning that you're going to have positive cash flow in the first three years and living as if you're going to have positive cash flow. It's a bad idea. Um, let me give you an example. I had a couple in their 20s who were used, had both worked for a car rental place, had pretty high earnings. In fact, they were close to 200,000 combined. They were used to living on that kind of income. Um, during the pandemic last year, they both lost, lost their job jobs. And so um, one of the couple went and found another corporate job at 60,000. The other decided to start a small business of a food truck. And oh, by the way, they wanted to start a family. Mm -hmm. And um, in meeting with me, um, it, oh, and, and the third thing was they moved in with the parents and rented out their condo so that they could, kn knowing they had, you know, much less money to, to uh, play with. So I said, first of all, you will be divorced in a year if you do all of those things. And um, two, you need to live on the income you're making, the, only the, the income the, from, the, from the salary. And so the spreadsheet I gave them was a day by day spreadsheet. When the check comes in, what the net check is, and when the bills are due, and when the next check come in, comes in, and when you're on a bi weekly, um, some two, two months out of the year, you get three checks. So what do you do with that third check? And I had suggested that that go into a savings account. So if you can live on two checks a month, third check goes into savings. Um, 
it has taken them a full year to get used to lower because there'd be some cash flow from the food truck and then they'd use it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you have, your mindset is I am sacrificing the present for the future. I am sacrificing no kids now. I am sacrificing um, the bare, the bare minimum, the absolutely bare minimum if you're only living on one check and the other, the cash flow has to keep going back into the business. If, because you can never live on one food truck. You're gonna to have to have a fleet of several in order to, so um, they just, they just, it was totally foreign to them to think that they couldn't go to Red Rocks whenever they wanted. They mm -hmm. couldn't, um, you know, buy, go to, go to Las Vegas for a long weekend whenever they wanted. Um, and that's the kind of team you need around you to just a reality check. Okay. I did some part I love it. That's <laughs> good. Else is for you, but what comes to Famos, you, okay. Like when we are up and running, like what is our what is each of our bare ass minimum? Like it covers couch here, covers the house, covers the food. Like that's the bare minimum that we need to be anything above and beyond. It's like kind of a stretch goal over here, but a lot of people don't understand that at all, even in their personal. <laughs> and that's why you're here also to find out what little additional savvy points you can you can learn. Can you look at them again for the six? Sure. Okay. Not being disciplined in bookkeeping, not engaging a team of professionals, not being aware of hobbies versus business, not funding a retirement account. And I will add to that um, do it yourself investing. I think um, of course, that's what I do for a living. So I'm going to propose a, a financial investment advisor as well. But if you're running a business and you've got kids and you're doing this and you're doing that, and then, oh, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to learn all about investing and keep track of it and do my, you know, daily stock picks and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that's a danger signal. And the last one is expecting positive cash flow during the first three years and living outside the means of of that cash flow. Uh huh. With investing, have you heard of TIFA accounts or tax free index accounts? Tax free index accounts. Yeah, it's just something I came across recently. No, but I will look into that. Yeah. So, tax free investments in general are what are called municipal bonds. So municipal bonds are bonds as compared to, as compared to stocks that um, are issued by a state or um, government um, entity. So interest from those are federal tax free. They're also state tax free if you buy them Colorado. So if you live in Colorado and you bought DIA bonds, those are double tax free. So tax-free index funds, I'm presuming, would be based on municipal bonds that are in an index. Um, but I didn't know there was a special class, so I'll follow up on that. Thank you. OK. Here's another question to say a little bit about bear gas, but you're great. Um, this question is from Kelly Bauer. Um, and she asked, um, so you can only start or contribute to a Roth IRA when you have a profitable, profitable year, or is there a certain profit you need to have in order to start a Roth IRA? You have to have earned income. So if you have, um, if let, let's say you work for a company that doesn't even have a retirement plan and you are on a salary and you have $60,000 of earned income, you could invest the maximum $6,000 out of that 60. So you need to have earned income, which is not social security or pension income or interest so income or difference between earned income and profit. Uh, in this case, none. Okay. It is the same because you're, if it were a business that you invested in, but you didn't run, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't be earned income because that's. Hmm. Um, what about a house, uh, rental? 
property. If you if you rent it out and you are the manager of it, yes. What if you have a property company? Well, Great. now we're getting into gray. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> technically, that's an well, but company. technically they report to you. But it's like it's a not, stock, if you got a dividend from a stock, that's not ours. That's not ours. It kind of is, but the I company, <laughs> the company earned it. Fair enough. Okay. But I was smart enough to know the company was going to earn it. <laughs> Yeah, you need a job with the IRS. <laughs> oh my God, can't imagine. 